the uh, announced title, which I suppose is somewhere, uh, was Critique of Madisonian Democracy. Uh, and that uh, title is uh, both too broad and too narrow for what I'm actually going to do. Uh, it's too broad because I'm not going to try to give a uh, really close analysis of Madison's complex and evolving uh, views over half a century. There is very good scholarship on the topic, including several recent studies that reach quite different assessments. Uh, I'm going to keep to my own choices uh, about the what seem to me the leading themes uh, that uh, are important for understanding the special nature of the Madisonian democratic experiment, uh, and uh, also the forms that it took as it evolved and is taking today. It's in this latter respect that the title is a bit too narrow. Uh, there's also a lot more to say uh, about the implications of all of this for global society, uh, but that I'll have to put aside for reasons of time. Well, the American experience uh, is surely the most important and interesting one to study uh, if we want to understand uh, the world of today and tomorrow. There are some very obvious reasons for that. Uh, one is simply the power and the primacy of the United States, which is completely without parallel. Uh, the second is the, its stable and long-standing institutions, which are also democratic institutions, which are exceptional and uh, arguably unique. Uh, thirdly, uh, the United States was as close to a tabula rasa uh, as it's possible to find in the historical world. Uh, and that was understood at the time. Uh, Tom Paine in 1776 uh, remarked that America can be as happy as she pleases. Uh, she hath a blank slate to write on. And that was more or less true. Uh, not necessarily for pretty reasons, but it was true. Uh, the indigenous societies, which were themselves rich and complex, were largely swept away. Uh, the neighboring regions were conquered uh, by force, including a third of Mexico. Uh, there was a vast and rich land with unparalleled resources uh, and uh, also advantages, uh, which was in fact open as a blank slate to write on. Uh, the United States was also unusually free from external threat, uh, uh, which again, gave opportunities for acting independently. The, the national territory of the United States hasn't been threatened since 1812. Uh, there's, a, there's a history of contrived threats, a long and interesting history. So for example, a century ago, the US Navy was defending our national territory off the coasts of Chile, uh, just to take one example. Uh, during the Cold War, last 50 years or so, uh, the threats were not only contrived, but consciously and rather deceitfully contrived, uh, and that's sort of conceded. Uh, so for example, after the second, uh, a crucial aspect of the golden age of, uh, uh, what's called the golden age of capitalist development after in the first 25 years or so after the Second World War, a crucial aspect of it was enormous government subsidy. Uh, and it was recognized in the late 1940s that the economy couldn't survive otherwise. Uh, the business press, Fortune and the Business Week and so on, pointed out right after the war that advanced industry cannot survive in a uh, free enterprise, competitive, unsubsidized economy, and the government must be the savior. The Truman administration moved in with huge military expenditures and explained sort of on the side uh, that the word to use is not subsidy, the word to use is security. Uh, so you can get people to pay, to agree to massive transfers of public funds to high-tech industry if you frighten them enough. And that's in fact been one function of the Cold War since the beginning. Uh, the same is true of intervention. It's recognized pretty much that a, go a good deal of the intervention, in fact probably 
you could argue almost all of it, uh, and military action over the last 50 years was under the guise of security, but was motivated by something else. Uh, that fact, too, is not unfamiliar to scholarship. So, for example, uh, although it isn't very well advertised, uh, Samuel Huntington, the well-known political scientist at Harvard, around 1980, when the Reagan administration was setting forth on a new wave of uh, state terrorism and intervention, uh, pointed out that uh, we may have to sell intervention and other military action uh, by creating the misimpression that it's the Soviet Union that we're fighting. He said, then he added that that's what the United States has been doing ever since the Truman Doctrine, which is more or less accurate. Uh, these are among the reasons why the so-called peace div dividend quickly vanished. Uh, it, it was never realistic to believe that there would be one, and of course there isn't, uh, and why policies continue approximately as before. Uh, very little change after the some tactical change, but nothing much with the end of the Cold War. And the reason is that the whole Pentagon system, which is a very broad system, uh, had uh, other uh, motives. Uh, and the concern, the contrived security threats were uh, designed to facilitate them, but now they go on with other pretexts. Uh, in any event, the country really was uniquely free from external threat. It's hard to find an analog. Uh, there's also, in the United States, very little residue of earlier European structures or an authentic conservative tradition. We don't really have conservatives in the United States. Uh, there are people who call themselves conservatives, but they're mostly radical statists uh, uh, who combine uh, support for an extremely powerful, intrusive state with coercive social norms, uh, something that a genuine conservative would uh, certainly wince at. Uh, the lack of a conservative tradition in the United States may be, in fact, probably is part of the reason uh, for the weakness, the relative weakness of the social contract and of support systems by comparative standards. These typically had their roots in pre-capitalist uh, institutions uh, and they don't exist much here. The blank slate didn't have them. I mean, it's not that they're missing, but uh, they're here to a much less extent than, say, Europe. Uh, the, this uh, blank slate did provide uh, opportunities to carry out political and uh, economic and social experiments without very much constraint. Uh, well, in studying history, uh, also, final comment about this, to, to quite an unusual extent, again, really unique, the so social socio-political <coughs> order was consciously designed using the advantages that were available. Now, in studying history, it's, uh, you can't construct experiments, but the United States is about as close to the ideal case of state capitalist democracy as, you as one can find and for that reason alone is particularly important to study, aside from its power and the stability of the institutions. Well, uh, furthermore, the main designer, <coughs> James Madison, was an astute political thinker and also a very lucid one. Uh, his views largely prevailed. Uh, Madison eloquently upheld the call for the preservation of the sacred faith of sacred fire of liberty uh, that he wrote into uh, George Washington's inaugural address. But it's important to understand his quite clear and explicit ideas about the kind of liberty that had to be preserved. Uh, these ideas perhaps come out most clearly in the debates on the Constitutional Convention, 1787. Uh, Madison focused uh, on England, naturally. That's the model for a democratic society that they would look at at the time. And he pointed out that, I'm quoting him, in England at this day, if elections were open to all classes of people, the property of landed proprietors would be insecure, and agrarian law would soon take place, what we would call agrarian reform, uh, which would infringe on property rights. Uh, and uh, the uh, uh, sacred fire of liberty that he spoke of is to burn most rightly uh, to preserve the rights to own property, which are privileged above all others. Uh, Madison went on in the debates 
to warn uh, that the uh, new government that they were framing, that they were constructing, uh, has to be designed in such a way to ward off the injustice that would come from a functioning democracy, uh, as in the example mentioned. That is, it would have to, I'm um, quoting him again, it would have to secure the permanent interests of the country against innovation with a, a variety of devices to protect the minority of the opulent against the majority. Uh, the permanent interests of the country that have to be preserved against innovation are property rights, in particular the rights of the opulent minority who have to be protect protected against the majority, meaning that democracy has to be a very limited uh, system. Uh, well, that remained the guiding principle from the framing of the Constitution up until today, uh, not only here, but also in the forms of democracy that the United States has been willing to tolerate uh, elsewhere. That's an important topic. I wish there were time to go into it, but I'll have to put it aside for lack of time. Uh, it's uh, easy to be misled by the public record, the public rhetoric uh, in which these ideas are generally framed. So in the Federalist Papers, which people read, uh, which were, of course, written for a public, you know, kind of like a propaganda document. The Federalist Papers uh, do discuss the rights of minorities and the need to protect their rights, but the discussion is framed in rather abstract and general terms. However, Madison made it quite clear uh, that he had a particular minority in mind, namely the minority of the opulent who have to be protected against the majority. Uh, the uh, um, that fact, I should say, is recognized uh, pretty much across the range of Madison scholarship. So even among those scholars who most strongly defend the uh, interpretation of Madison as a committed Democrat, uh, you find the same recognition. The most important of those is Lance Banning, who's a fine scholar, published the most recent extensive Madison biography. Uh, and he argues against other Madison scholars that Madison differed most profoundly from other leading framers uh, by according the people's right to rule the same importance as the protection of the rights of property. Uh, as Banning puts it, throughout his life, Madison kept to his principle that in a just and free government, the rights both of property and of persons ought to be effectively guarded. Notice he's arguing against another stream of scholarship which holds that Madison concentrated f on property rights, not uh, the rights of persons. And he takes the view that Madison insisted that both, both be preserved. Uh, that, uh, uh, however, even Banning, who's at the extreme in this respect, agrees that, I'm quoting him, in Madison's determination to protect minorities against majority infringements of their rights, it is absolutely clear that he was most especially concerned for the properties, for the propertied minorities among the people. Uh, that position, somewhat obscured in the Federalist Papers, uh, is unambiguous, uh, forceful, and explicit, uh, particularly in the original constitutional debates, as in the passages I quoted, although it's sometimes masked by the public presentation. Uh, I should note, important to recognize that although there is a consensus in Madison scholarship about Madison's special concern for the propertied minorities, the way that the consensus is formulated very much understates the point. So have a look again at the defense of Madison as a true Democrat at the outer limits, Lance Banning, Madison kept to his principle that in a just and free government, the right both of property and of persons ought to be effectively guarded. And that's a standard formulation, but it's kind of misleading. You really have to think about what it means. So we have the rights of persons and we have the rights of property and they have to be balanced. But what are the rights of property? So for example, take say this pen, okay, it's my property. Uh, what rights does this pen have? Well, the answer is the pen doesn't have any rights. Uh, property has no rights. That's meaningless. 
uh, maybe I have a right to property. So somebody could say, okay, I have a right to own the pen, you could argue that. Uh, but the pen itself has no rights. So rights of property is an extremely misleading phrase. What it refers to and sort of masks is the rights of persons to own property. Uh, well, uh, furthermore, it's worth noting that that particular right is not like other rights. So for example, my right to free speech doesn't infringe on your right to free speech. Okay, but my right to own the pen does infringe on your right to own the pen. If I own it, you don't. Okay. Uh, so here we have a special right, namely the right of persons to own property, which has to be balanced against all other rights and happens to be different from others, and it's the one right that excludes other people. Right? Uh, so the Madisonian principle, once we sort of take away the array of you know, misleading formulations, the Madisonian principle is uh, that government must guard the rights of persons generally, but it must provide special additional uh, guarantees for the rights of one class of persons, namely property owners, uh, and their, that particular right of theirs, which infringes on the rights of others, has to be privileged among all other rights. Uh, that means the landed proprietors in England who might be threatened by agrarian reform in a democratic society, uh, and the opulent minority generally uh, who have to be protected against the majority uh, in uh, the new society that uh, they're developing. Uh, this all took on quite a different meaning a century later. I'll get to that. <coughs> uh, Madison foresaw that the threat of democracy was going to become more severe uh, over time because of the increase, quoting, because of the increase in the proportion of those who will labor under all the hardships of life and secretly sigh for a more equal distribution of its blessings. Uh, he warned that equality of suffrage, the equal laws of suffrage, might in time shift power into their hands. Uh, he said, this is still the Constitutional Conventions. He said, no agrarian attempts have yet been made in this country, but the symptoms of a leveling spirit have sufficiently appeared in certain quarters uh, to give warning of the future danger. The future danger is a danger of democracy, notice. Uh, the basic task that Madison faced in framing a system which we wish to last for ages was to ensure that the actual rulers will be the opulent minority. Uh, they will, as he put it, secure the rights of property. Again, a misleading formulation. That means the privileged right to property, which stands above all other personal rights. So they will secure the rights of property against the dangers uh, from an equality of, universal, of univers universality of suffrage which would vest complete power over property in hands without a share in it, which will certainly be true uh, as under his accurate prediction uh, that the proportion of those who labor under the hardships of life and secretly sigh for a more equal distribution of its benefits uh, will only grow. Uh, how do you do this? Uh, well, first of all, notice that m this is one position that Madison never changed throughout his life. So in 1829, when he was reflecting uh, on uh, half a century of American democracy, he stressed again that those without property or, uh, or the hope of acquiring it cannot be expected to sympathize sufficiently with its rights to be the safe depository of power over them. Again, not rights of property, but rights to property. Uh, the solution that he came up with back in 1787 was to ensure that the upper house, which would have the Senate, which would have the main power, uh, would ought to come from and represent the wealth of the nation, the more capable set of men who will sympathize sufficiently with the rights of property and will protect the opulent minority against the majority. Uh, and the system that was designed, the voting patterns, the checks and balances, the distribution of powers, uh, it was arranged for the same end. The idea was that the, the, the wealthy would essentially run it, uh, 
uh, and uh, the general society would be fragmented, uh, offered only kind of a limited participation in the public arena, which is to be effectively in the hands of the wealthy and their agents. Uh, let me stress the consensus among Madison scholars on this topic. So again, Lance Banning, who most strongly affirms uh, Madison's dedication to popular rule agrees, quoting him, that Madison's constitution was intrinsically an aristocratic document designed to check the democratic tendencies of the period. Uh, it was designed to deliver power to a better sort of people, as he put it, excluding those who were not rich, well-born, or prominent from exercising political power. Now, there is a debate about how well, how firmly that line was held in the years that followed, but there's no serious debate about the original intent, uh, which was quite clear uh, and becomes still more clear, I think, if we think through the reasoning uh, that led to it, as particularly as expressed in the constitutional debates, which I quoted. Uh, and whatever room for debate there might be, uh, about the early years of the, uh, of the system, uh, by with the time we reach the end of the 19th century uh, and on until today, I think there can be very little doubt that the democratic tendencies of the revolutionary period were very well contained uh, and that power is uh, firmly in the hands of the wealth of the nation uh, who safeguard the principle that the minority of the opulent must be project protected against the majority. Uh, well, this account of the Madisonian roots of uh, uh, the prevailing conceptions of democracy uh, is unfair in one important respect. Uh, like Adam Smith and uh, other founders of classical liberalism, Madison was pre-capitalist and anti-capitalist in spirit. Uh, Lance Banning describes him as an 18th century gentleman of honor to depths that we today are hardly able to imagine. Uh, he had nothing but contempt for what Adam Smith called the vile maxim of the masters of mankind, uh, all for ourselves and nothing for anyone else. Uh, and it's quite likely that Madison would have sympathized with the uh, so-called factory girls and artisans of eastern Massachusetts uh, in the early days of the Industrial Revolution, which began around here, uh, when they condemned what they called the new spirit of the age, uh, gain wealth, forgetting all but self, uh, which they regarded as a degrading and demeaning doctrine uh, that destroyed human values and signaled the defeat of uh, the American Revolution to uh, working people in the rising industrial society. Uh, by now, it's perhaps hard for us to remember how uh, shocking was the radical capitalist ideology uh, that started to come along around the 1820s. It was given its sharpest uh, doctrinal form in what was called the new science of uh, economics of David Ricardo and Malthus and Nassau Sr. and others, uh, the new science rejected the traditional view that people have a right to live. Uh, that was taken for granted in traditional societies, feudal societies, slave societies, and so on. Uh, it was assumed that people have some kind of a place, a right to be in that place, uh, generally a pretty rotten place, but at least some kind of a place. Uh, however, the new science challenged that. Uh, it proved, uh, with the certainty of Newton's laws, as Ricardo put it modestly, uh, it proved that people have no rights uh, apart from what they can gain in the market. Uh, you only hurt the poor by trying to help them, so the new science proved. Uh, and if people can't survive in the labor market, since they have no other rights, they should go somewhere else. Uh, which was not impossible in those days. Uh, recall that free movement of labor uh, is a fundamental uh, principle of free market doctrine. You don't, have free, you don't have free movement of labor, you don't have free market. Uh, that's uh, one of the many principles that are overlooked uh, as <coughs> the theory has been converted uh, 
into a, a weapon, an ideological weapon uh, of oppression uh, in the service of the uh, vile maxim and the opulent minority, relying very heavily on state power. Uh, for example, subsidies under the guise of security. Uh, I should add that even Ricardo, who was the leading exponent of the new science, uh, was unable to free himself completely from traditional human sentiments. Uh, so Ricardo recognized uh, that his famous uh, principle of comparative advantage uh, was based on the assumptions that labor is mobile and that capital is immobile. If you drop those assumptions, doesn't work. Uh, that's incidentally the opposite of what prevails today. Labor is immobile and capital is mobile, uh, but we're still supposed to worship at the shrine, even though the assumptions on which the conclusion rests have been reversed. Uh, in Ricardo's day, the uh, assumptions were not all that unrealistic. Uh, there were vast open spaces which were being cleared of their inhabitants, uh, and that meant a place for impoverished people of Europe uh, and criminals. Uh, there was much less need for prisons in those days because you could send them off to the United States and Australia, uh, uh, and also for poor people. They could move once the land was cleared. Uh, but uh, what about uh, uh, capital? Well. Capital was largely a matter of land, and land is immobile, so that part of the assumption is correct. Uh, but as for the rest, uh, Ricardo remained a captive of pre-capitalist values. Uh, he argued that the rich would be satisfied with a low rate of profits in their own country rather than seek a more advantageous employment for their wealth in foreign nations. And the reason they would do that is just because of human sentiment. Uh, community spirit, and so on. Uh, Adam Smith had a much clearer view in this regard years earlier when he said, no, they're going to follow the vile maxim. Uh, uh, so the point is, even Ricardo found it hard to free himself from the taint of human sentiments, despite the teachings of the new science. Uh, but it was a dramatic change. Uh, the restriction, sharp restriction in the concept of human rights that was a central component of rising industrial capitalism, that continues right to the present. Uh, as a result of quite extensive and often violent popular struggle over long periods, uh, there is now a reasonably large array of rights that have been won. Uh, and there are now even international conventions on human rights. The basic one is the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of December 1948. <clears throat> that declaration inspires quite a good deal of noble rhetoric and, you know, posturing before TV cameras and so on. Uh, <clears throat> it can also be used by the powerful very selectively as a weapon against some current enemy. But the reality of the matter is that no state takes the principles of the Universal Declaration seriously. Uh, the United States, for example, flatly rejects a good part of its solemn commitments, as expressed in the Universal Declaration, namely the whole range of articles concerning social and political rights, which we simply assert do not apply. We declare that they are invalid, though we sign them, of course. Uh, the, uh, uh, this is a residue of the principled denial of such rights uh, under the pure form of market doctrine that was prescribed and preached by the new science. Uh, meanwhile, in Sinai, the United States parades uh, uh, courageously as the defender of uh, human, of the Universal Declaration against third world relativists, all kind of bad guys. Uh, that's a pretty impressive propaganda achievement and it's a tribute to the obedience of the educated classes, folks like us, uh, that they can get away with it, uh, as they do. There's never any challenge to this, even though it's radically false on the most obvious and transparent grounds. Uh, the fate of the new science as a weapon of class warfare uh, and in delimiting the importance of human rights 
Uh, that's an interesting part of the history of the last 180 years uh, and a very lively and important topic today, but a different one. And again, I'll have to put it aside. Well, let's go back to Madison. Uh, as an 18th century gentleman, his values were pre-capitalist. He expected the wealthy men uh, who would be given power to be, as he put it, enlightened statesmen, pure and noble, uh, benevolent philosophers who uh, will work selflessly for the public good. Uh, he soon learned differently as the opulent minority uh, used their power exactly as Adam Smith had described, namely pursuing their vile maxim. And by 1792, uh, Madison already w recognized that there were problems. He warned that the Hamiltonian developmental state was substituting the motive of private interest in place of public duty, leading to a real domination of the few under an apparent liberty of the many. Uh, Madison deplored the daring depravity of the times as the stock jobbers become the Praetorian guard of government, at once its tools and its tyrants, bribed by its largesses and overawing it with their powers and combinations. Well, apart from the eloquence of the rhetoric, it's not a bad picture of the modern world and the state of democracy in it. Uh, it's a picture, incidentally, that's shared by over 80% of the population in the United States who hold that the government works for the few, the few and the special interests, not for the people. That's up from a regular 50% or so about 15 years ago. Uh, there are related judgments. Uh, the same percentage, over 80%, regards the economic system as inherently unfair. Uh, about the same percentage holds that business has too much power, working people too little. And by about 20 to 1, which is a huge number for a poll, uh, uh, it's believed that business should sacrifice profits for workers and communities. Uh, that's another ominous sign of that leveling spirit that uh, Madison warned about and the need for vigilance to protect the opulent minority against the majority by ensuring that democratic forms have very limited function. Well, with all of its flaws from the standpoint of democratic principle, Madisonian democracy did take a long step towards uh, popular democratic government. It was a new departure, but in fact in complex ways. Uh, at the doctrinal level, there were indeed regressive features. Right? That's, of course, a value judgment, but I think it's sustainable. Uh, and it becomes clearer, I think, if we look back at the history of democratic theory, which goes way back before Madison. Uh, so let's get, go back to its origins, uh, the sort of founding document of modern political theory, Aristotle's politics, which is careful and well-argued uh, and very timely. Uh, it uh, focuses on central themes of everybody's agenda. Uh, Aristotle quite carefully discusses many different kinds of possible society, uh, democracy, his preference. Uh, he dis discusses what a democracy should be. It should be a community of equals aiming at the best, best life possible for all, at the common good. It should be a community of free men, uh, equal and participatory. Uh, notice, incidentally, free men, that's meant literally, uh, men, doesn't, not women, uh, not slaves, of course. So his concept of people is limited, but uh, before being too critical of Aristotle, we should remember that it's only in very recent years that these fundamental flaws in democratic theory have begun to be addressed in this century, uh, and still only quite partially. Uh, well, to achieve these ends, uh, democracy, Aristotle went on to say, must be a welfare state. He didn't use the phrase, but that's what he's describing. Uh, a democracy, he said, must provide lasting pr pr uh, prosperity for all by distribution of public revenues, by means that he goes on to describe. Uh, the goal is relative equality of outcome, of condition. Okay. Uh, uh, the uh, notice that the contemporary doctrine, equality of opportunity, that's a much more recent innovation. Uh, it's related to the rise of 
uh, industrial capitalism with its narrowing of the concept of human rights, uh, namely to those that can be obtained through the market. Uh, though in the real world, I stress again that there's a rather large footnote, uh, the rich and the powerful demand and receive uh, ample protection from market discipline. Uh, for this, they rely on a very powerful nanny state which transfers public revenues to them uh, on a massive scale and protects them in other ways. Uh, it sometimes reaches the level of sheer farce, uh, as in the United States recently, or England, uh, where uh, the Reaganites here uh, extolled the glories of the free market to the poor at home and abroad, while at the same time they were boasting proudly to the business community that they were breaking all post-war records uh, in protectionism and public subsidy for the rich, as indeed they were, uh, or say when Newt Gingrich uh, preaches stern lessons to seven-year-old children uh, on the need to uh, uh, learn responsibility and overcome the debilitating culture of dependency, while at the same time he holds the record, uh, the championship for bringing federal subsidies to his own rich constituents uh, who can, if they had to face market discipline, would perhaps be selling rags. Uh, but they can applaud their entrepreneurial values and their conservatism uh, under the wing of the nanny state uh, and all get away with it again. So this proceeds without comment thanks to the extremely impressive self-discipline of the educated classes. You really have to give credit to the educational institutions. They do their job. Uh, the uh, classic thesis going back to Aristotle is that in a free and just society, uh, we should seek to achieve equality of outcome. Uh, therefore, it must be a welfare state in which, as he put it, everyone has moderate and sufficient means with the extremes of wealth and power uh, eliminated. That isn't achieved. Uh, talk of democracy is not serious uh, because there cannot be free and equal participation uh, in self-government quite apart from the resulting injustice uh, and the infringement on fundamental human rights, again, in the pre-capitalist sense of human rights in which human beings are considered to have intrinsic value other than market value. Uh, these uh, ideas persist right through the Enlightenment and classical liberalism. For example, take Adam Smith. Uh, Adam Smith, as everyone knows, gave an argument for markets, but a rather nuanced argument if you look closely. Uh, and it's also interesting to look at his reasoning. His argument, nuanced argument for markets, was based on the assumption that under conditions of perfect liberty, markets would lead to perfect equality. That is, they would lead to equality of outcome, which is an obvious desideratum for a free and just society. He didn't even bother to argue that point because it was taken for granted. Uh, his, uh, for the same reason, uh, Adam Smith was in favor of, as he put it, government regulation in favor of the workmen, which he said is always just and equitable, but not in favor of the masters. Uh, everyone is familiar with Adam Smith's uh, remarks about how wonderful division of labor is in the first paragraph of Wealth of Nations, but not too many people go a hundred, couple hundred pages later. Uh, where he points out that division of labor is an atrocity uh, and that in any civilized government, any civilized society, the government will have to intervene uh, to protect people against the division of labor uh, because it will turn human beings into creatures as stupid and as ignorant as it's possible for a human being to be. And therefore, it must be stopped. Same principle. We have to can't accept these things when they don't lead to relative equality of outcome. Uh, and that's common. Take another major figure of the liberal pantheon, Alexis de Tocqueville. Uh, he also took it for granted that equality of outcome was the desideratum to be sought. Uh, he warned, in fact, of the danger. He was talking about democracy in America, remember, in the 1830s. Uh, and he praised it. He warned, however, of the danger of a permanent inequality of condition and an end of democracy if the manufacturing aristocracy rising before our eyes, one of the harshest that has ever existed, escapes its bounds, as of course it did beyond his worst nightmares. Uh, this uh, uh, 
I should say that another a, a related and very important element in classical liberalism was opposition to wage labor, which goes much deeper. Uh, a classic formula uh, is that uh, um, if a person produces on command, let's say under wage labor, if an artisan produces something beautiful on command, we may admire what he does, but we despise what he is because he's not a free human being using his own initiative and powers to create. Uh, uh, de Tocqueville took the same view. He, as he put it, the art advances, but the artisan recedes. Uh, the Adam Smith had the same view. His critique of division of labor, which I mentioned, uh, is at a deep level, a critique of labor on command, wage labor, which violates the essential human right to freedom to be a free, creative person. Uh, modern political theory sometimes recognizes a version of this picture, but a rather attenuated one, I think. Uh, it recognizes that opposition to wage labor uh, was quite real, but it attributes it to uh, the Republican conception of civic virtue. Uh, that is, wage labor undermines the independence of spirit that's essential for self-government. That interpretation is certainly correct, but I think it's only part of a much deeper and more interesting story that is a deeper opposition to wage labor uh, based on a conception of natural rights and human nature, a conception which is quite interesting in itself, but it, interesting roots, but that is it's another topic again. Uh, well, however one interprets the fact, the opposition to wage labor remained a very powerful current of uh, American thought and also struggle uh, right through the 19th century. The labor movement from the 1830s up to the huge Knights of Labor organization through the end of the century, uh, it condemned wage labor as an infringement, uh, an intolerable infringement on essential human rights. Uh, the independent labor press, which was just being done by working people in their own factories and so on, it held to the principle that those who work in the mills should own them. Uh, all of this, I should say, is as American as apple pie uh, without the uh, dubious contributions of radical intellectuals. Uh, uh, and it extended well beyond the working class. So uh, Abraham Lincoln, for example, held that it is wrong for capital to buy labor in slave societies and it is no less wrong for capital to hire labor uh, under what was always called wage slavery, except as a temporary expedient uh, on the way to freedom. Uh, that uh, was the ideological banner under which Northern wor workers fought the Civil War, uh, Michael Sandel over at Harvard points out correctly. The Republican Party uh, proudly presented itself quoted slogans, as not only the anti-slavery party, but emphatically as the party of free labor. Free labor meaning free from wage slavery, from working on command. That's the Republican Party. Uh, the New York Times in 1869 condemned the advance of wage labor as the rise of a system of slavery as absolute, if not as degrading, as that which lately prevailed at the South. Uh, well come quite a long way since those days. Uh, but uh, these ideas, which are truisms in my opinion, uh, remained alive well into this century. Uh, take, say, John Dewey, He's the leading American social philosopher, again, as American as apple pie, his roots are right here. Uh, his, the main focus of his work was on democracy, uh, and he held that talk of democracy is idle uh, when big business rules the life of the society, controlling production, commerce, communication, and the press, uh, democracy, he said, presupposes, also presupposes a transition from a feudalistic to a democratic social order in which workers are masters of their own industrial fate, uh, not tools who, lent them, who have to rent themselves to private tyrannies. Uh, as long as the feudalistic social order remains in place, he held. Uh, politics is nothing more than the shadow cast over society by big business. 
uh, the tools and the tyrants of government in Madison's phrase, and democracy is only a matter of form. Well, that's a powerful and central tradition uh, in Western intellectual history that goes from the origins of recorded thought about democracy and Aristotle, uh, democracy and freedom right into the 20th century, including substantial currents of the Enlightenment and classical liberalism, and Madisonian democracy was a departure from it uh, for reasons I've already mentioned, but actually it was a departure in an even deeper sense uh, than I've already indicated. So let's go back to Aristotle. Uh, remember that for him, a leveling spirit is essential to democracy. Uh, otherwise, it cannot be free and equal and participatory. But Aristotle also gave another reason. This one's kind of hypothetical. He said, imagine that a democracy, kind of a logical reason. He said, suppose a democracy could exist uh, in which there really was free participation, suffrage, in other words. Uh, but there was the majority of the population were poor and wealth were concentrated. Well, under those circumstances, he said, the majority would use their voting power uh, to, for their own ends, uh, not for the common good of all. And a well-run democracy should be run for the common good of all. Uh, notice that James Madison faced exactly the same problem, raised exactly the same problem in the Constitutional Convention in the remarks that I quoted about the threat of agrarian reform. He said, suppose there were a democracy in England, people could vote then they would carry out an agrarian reform, they'd vote in their own interests, and they would threaten the rights of landed proprietors, what he misleadingly called the rights of property. Well, they both faced the same dilemma, Aristotle and Madison, exactly the same dilemma, but they gave different solutions. Uh, Aristotle's solution was to restrict poverty with a welfare state. Uh, then democracy would be possible. Madison, facing exactly the same dilemma, drew the opposite conclusion, uh, we must restrict democracy so that the privilege of the opulent minority is protected. Now, these are crucially important facts about American democracy, uh, which in a free society would be taught in high schools, civics courses, in my opinion, and would be common knowledge. Uh, notice I'm not using any exotic sources. These are absolutely the standard, major, you know, intellectual roots of our society and thought. Uh, it's a crucially important departure from a classical tradition taken on pre-capitalist assumptions, however, as I mentioned. Well, all of these issues took on a very different form towards the end of the 19th century and since. Uh, recall the Madisonian principle, departure from traditional theories of democracy and rights, but still a principle, namely the rights of persons must be protected but certain of these rights, namely the right to property, must be privileged above others. Now, for Madison, persons meant persons. But toward the end of the 19th century, the concept of person underwent a radical change in a highly undemocratic manner uh, with the growth of the industrial economy uh, and the concentration of power in new corporate entities. Uh, that brings us to the last century in which all of this takes a very different form. Uh, recall that corporations were initially considered to be, uh, the, the theory of the corporation was a grant or concession theory. Uh, so for example, if we want to get together and you know build a bridge across a river or something, we can become incorporated to carry out that task. Uh, we can, we are partners, it's a partnership. Uh, we can get a state charter to carry out that task, that's corporation. Uh, the corporation was legally bound to keep to the stated limits, namely build that bridge, that's what we got the charter for, uh, and the corporation had no rights. Uh, the only rights were the rights of the participants, the individuals in the partnership, the individual owners. Uh, now, that's what a corporation was, okay? Uh, through the 19th century, the picture began to change. Uh, there were huge economic changes, especially after the Civil War, uh, by the end of the 19th century, by around 1890, three quarters of the wealth of the country was controlled by corporations. Uh, by now, the top few hundred uh, control most of the domestic economy and most of the international economy itself, an enormous infringement on freedom and rights. Uh, as the economy changed, legal theory changed along with it. 
not by legislation, but in the hands of courts and lawyers and intellectuals. It began to recognize uh, uh, corporations had been artif called artificial entities, set up as partnerships with no rights for a stated purpose and chartered that way. But they came to be regarded as natural entities, uh, as collectivist legal institutions, as the le leading legal historian of the process over at Harvard, Morton Horowitz, describes it. Uh, these natural entities were granted the rights of persons, uh, in fact, mostly early in this century. Uh, in fact, immortal persons, uh, so much more than the rights of persons. Uh, and there were no longer any limits on what they could do. They didn't have to keep to their stated purpose. So they could acquire property, or they had First Amendment rights, and so on. Uh, this became very serious uh, w when New Jersey kind of broke ranks and permitted the right of incorporation in 1889 uh, with no constraints at all. Corporations could do anything they want, so they all started flocking to New Jersey. Uh, that's uh, why you have things like Standard Oil of New Jersey and so on. That forced other states to go along, you know, to destroy the traditional constraints as well. Uh, it's, the, it's one of the reasons, incidentally, why business is so much in favor of devolution these days, of reducing power from the federal government to the states. Then it's much easier to play one state against another and to make sure that uh, public revenues really go to the opulent minority, not to anyone else. So if federal grants go from government to federal to state level, you can be pretty sure of that. Uh, the uh, the uh, New Jersey legislation is a typical example. Uh, the uh, intellectual roots of this transition from corporations as artificial partnerships to collectivist legal institutions, uh, that the intellectual roots of that are neo-Hegelian, uh, they have to do with the idea that organic entities that stand over and above people have greater rights than people. Uh, the same intellectual roots uh, are the roots of fascism and Bolshevism. Uh, it means, and in fact, the three systems are very much on a par, corporations, fascism, and Bolshevism. I think that becomes pretty clear when you look at the thinking that lies behind them. Uh, that's the, essentially the end of the national rights doctrine, the idea that... Uh, rights uh, derive from the nature of people. Uh, there was a parallel shift, which is interesting. Uh, the courts began to change. Uh, originally, the corporation was the owners, the p participants, like us, if we form a partnership. That picture gradually shifted, and the corporation was identified with the directors, okay, uh, not the people. So the corporation became, so it became the directors in legal theory. Uh, there was a parallel shift in, uh, in the Bolshevik system. Uh, uh, in fact, it was predicted by Rosa Luxemburg and, and by Trotsky, in fact, in the early days before he joined in himself. Uh, what they pointed out and predicted was that the Bolshevik system would talk about the people uh, but the, the, and the working class, but the working class would be placed under the rule of the party uh, and the party under the rule of the Central Committee and the Central Committee under the rule of the maximal leader exactly what happened, of course. Uh, and very much the same happened in the history of our form of uh, collectivist legal institutions, corporations, as, pow as the concept of what the corporation is. First of all, it got a status as an organic entity over and above people with greater rights, uh, but also it became identified with the central committee, uh, not the participants. Uh, and the leadership, the CEO, even in legal theory. Those are interesting parallels that should be more uh, discussed, I think. I should say that it w all of this was appalling to conservatives, uh, genuine conservatives. This shift to collectivist legal institutions was very much opposed by conservatives uh, who regarded the laws that ratif these as laws that ratify a new absolutism, as one leading conservative legal scholar put it, establishing entities that are like kings and princes uh, and destroying individual rights and, of course, also destroying markets. I remember that these are huge commands e economies. I mean, any business is an interference with the market internally. It doesn't work by market principles. When you get to these huge organic entities, I mean, internally market principles are gone and, of course, they're enormous. Uh, another uh, uh, one classic study, Robert Brady, Veblenite economist around 1940, 
uh, point in an important book, pointed out that these new corporate entities, uh, he said, are strict top to bottom absolutisms, the inverse of democratic control. Uh, they follow the strict conditions of dictatorial power. And if you look at the structure, you see that that's pretty obvious. Equally obvious, they cast the shadow that uh, we call politics over society. The, they are its tools and its tyrants, to quote Dewey and Madison. And they're also, of course, dedicated to a propaganda program, I'm quoting Brady, that uh, becomes a matter of converting the public to the goals of the control pyramid. It's another matter of great importance for contemporary democracy, which I don't really have time to go into, but of enormous importance. Again, the kind of thing that would be taught in high school civics courses in a free society. Uh, well, that brings us up to our present period. Uh, the question is often raised, uh, how corporations affect democracy? It's kind of an odd question. It's sort of like asking how sulfuric acid affects metals or how uh, <laughs> lions affect lambs in the real world, not particularly friendly. Uh, the, they're antithetical, you know, they're absolutely antithetical. Uh, in their internal structure, they're totalitarian. Uh, their influence and control is extraordinary uh, in economic uh, economy, pol politics, and social life. As to the means of communication, which are, of course, essential to a democracy, we don't even have to ask the, how corporations influence them. They just are corporations uh, with consequences that are quite predictable and well verified. Uh, has enormous international implications as well, which I can't go into. Well, let me just sum up. Uh, there is a line of thinking that goes from Aristotle right through the Enlightenment and classical liberalism. Uh, to John Dewey, others, Bertrand Russell and others in this century, major theme of the indigenous American working class movements independently. Uh, and it seems to me to uh, identify a very significant and uh, appropriate uh, uh, principles about democracy and freedom. In a sense, the business world agrees with this, except that the values are reversed. That is, they're opposed to democracy for perfectly obvious reasons, uh, although it's okay if the shadow is properly cast uh, and uh, power remains in the hands of the wealthy of the country. Uh, the business world is also opposed to markets, again, for obvious reasons, uh, though selectively. Uh, markets are okay for temporary advantage when the playing field is properly tilted, uh, typically as uh, result of large-scale state intervention. That's a leading thesis of economic history from England right up till the newly growth areas of East Asia. Uh, the United States is a dramatic example illustrating that from its origins uh, as a highly protectionist country re relying heavily on state power for industrial development. Uh, and that goes right up to today to the celebration of the World Trade Organization on telecommunications a couple of weeks ago. Uh, meanwhile, the uh, society resists, uh, and over time it has, uh, it has never accepted the principle of the new science that people have no rights. Uh, the uh, society has resisted in various ways, uh, and over time it's uh, expanded the reach of human rights, of democracy. Uh, it's a painfully slow process. It's uh, also cyclic. There are periods of regression. We're in a period of significant regression right now, in my opinion. But over time, I think you can sort of sense a slow advance towards something like the Aristotelian principles. Uh, now, however, extended beyond his category of free men uh, and towards a conception of human rights that has been much enriched and widened by intensive popular struggle over the years. All of this goes on in parallel to increasing power for the new absolutists, absolutism of the corporations, the new kings and princes uh, that uh, conservatives uh, uh, condemned uh, uh, a, sen a century ago, as did working men and women. Uh, well, the long-term outcome of that conflict is unpredictable, but I think it's important to stress that it is controllable. Uh, there's a major propaganda effort underway now to make people feel hopeless and resigned. 
it's all out of control, you know, mysterious forces of globalization and markets and this and that and the other thing. Uh, almost total fraud when you look at it, but understandable. It makes people feel hopeless, resigned, passive, you know, what can I do? I'll look for survival strategies. Uh, uh, these are human decisions and human institutions. Uh, they're under popular control in principle and even in practice uh, if there's sufficient dedication uh, in support of democracy and human rights. Even the famous globalization is not dramatically different in scale from, say, early in this century. Uh, and the extent to which it is different is easily under public control. Uh, as for the institutions themselves, uh, like others, including the fascist and Bolshevik uh, forms of absolutism, uh, they have to demonstrate their legitimacy, as always in human life. Uh, if they can't demonstrate their legitimacy, they should be dismantled, as has often happened in the past. Uh, and dismantling them makes it, may make it possible at least, uh, to advance towards uh, fundamental principles of justice and freedom uh, that are quite deeply rooted in the traditions of thought and popular struggle for thousands of years.